very happy to introduce this evening uh, Dr. Ronnie Broman. Uh, just a few words uh, about uh, about him. Uh, Ronnie was born in uh, West Jerusalem, but lived uh, most of his life in, in, in France. Um, he studied. Uh, I mean, he's a medical doctor in uh, tropical disease, specialized in tropical diseases, and was active very, very soon in, uh, in uh, the humanitarian field since 1977 uh, in international medical assistance, uh, and became the president of Doctors Without Borders between 1982 and 1994. Uh, I remember seeing Ronnie on television in 99 when Doctor Without Borders uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize. He was part of a delegation of three or four, I don't remember how many they were, but he was there, they were all there with t-shirts and the name of their organization. That was very nice. For once, a, a deserved cheese price. Not all other cheese price, as you know, but are deserved like this one. Um, he uh, is uh, uh, I mean, still involved in the, uh, even with Doctors Without Borders, in uh, its uh, foundation and uh, research activities. Uh, Ronnie uh, uh, teaches at the Institut d'Etudes Politiques. Uh, in Paris, which is better known as Sciences Po. And he, since, uh, I don't, I mean, it's quite recent, I think, he started, is uh, now teaching even in, in, the, in the UK, in the University of Manchester, uh, Manchester, in the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute. Um, I mean, on top of, uh, of uh, the activities that I mentioned, uh, Ronnie is a thinker about his own activity and the activities of the organizations uh, in which he has been involved. He's written many books, uh, starting from, I mean, the one probably the first one that, uh, uh, as a book, I, I, at least I heard of, it was in 93, I don't know if he published anything before that, it was about Somalia, uh, The Humanitarian Crime was the title. And it was followed by a constant flow of uh, books. I won't uh, uh, read all the titles. Unfortunately, uh, they are in French. I'm not aware of any book by Ronnie Roman, but this should really be, be done and uh, translate uh, his, his, uh, his writings um, into English. At least, uh, well, just if you take just last year, uh, you have uh, three titles published. One is a small one about humanitarian uh, medical uh, action, uh, Médecine Humanitaire, in a, a very widely distributed uh, uh, small size, small pocket uh, book uh, size uh, uh, edition in France. Another is about, is a kind of uh, 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 long interview about why he became um, activist doctor in the humanitarian field. And the third is a, a book of uh, discussion, and the title is, uh, let me translate it, I mean, the humanitarian action, let's say, diplomacy and human rights. So these three books came out uh, uh, just uh, last year, and I hope that uh, uh, some of all that will soon be available to English, uh, English readership. Uh, on, in addition to all that, um, Ronnie is, has been uh, active in other fields. He has uh, co-realized, uh, uh, co-directed a film. I mean, it's a documentary based on documentary archives. Uh, uh, on uh, the, I mean, it's based or inspired by Hannah Arendt's famous uh, Eichmann in uh, uh, Jerusalem. And it's a wonderful actually documentary. Has it been uh, shown in English? And yeah, it has been. So it, it should be available in, in some form. Um, and 
he is active also on the issue of, uh, of Israel-Palestine. Uh, <laughs> Roni has taken uh, strong positions in denouncing uh, Israeli violence against the Palestinians and rejecting any use uh, or pretense by the Israeli state of representing uh, all Jews. But, uh, well, today we are here to listen to him uh, speak about the, about the humanitarian <coughs> issue, humanitarianism at the risk of imperialism. Following that, as usual, we'll have uh, a discussion, questions and answers, and let us focus on the topic of tonight among his many topics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilbert. Gilbert, I don't know. <laughs> Gilbert, for this very kind of uh, presentation. Uh, I've read somewhere that uh, if you want to make your audience uh, fall asleep, you just have to say that you're so thrilled and, and glad to be here addressing this uh, audience. Well, though it is not advised, I must say that I'm quite uh, happy to be here and to speak to you. And uh, the, as, a, as an evidence of my uh, being happy to be here, I must say that uh, my main fear was to train across the channel and being stuck under 40 meters of, uh, of sea and claustrophobic, and that was the main ordeal I had to go through. So I did it. Uh, it's fine, I'm here, <laughs> and we're going to shift to uh, serious uh, matters. Um, humanitarianism uh, is about uh, relieving the suffering of uh, people in, in need, uh, regardless of their creeds, uh, political or philosophical uh, affiliation. That is uh, more or less a definition which I think anyone can uh, accept. It is self-evident in the name of uh, humankind, in the name of uh, humanity uh, in general, uh, suffering has, has to be uh, lived and uh, visited. The issue of uh, how uh, we behave regard, uh, with respect to the root causes, do we address the root causes or do we leave them uh, aside? Is uh, debatable, is a disputed, is a heated uh, issue in humanitarian circles? We think, I, I think we'll come back uh, to this. I must say, to be uh, quite uh, straightforward, that uh, I advocate the position of uh, humanitarian <coughs> not addressing the good uh, causes, and I hope uh, that after this uh, conference, uh, my position will be more understandable because, of course, it is rather counterintuitive to, uh, to say uh, this. But I will say uh, that in the first place, uh, this is both uh, humanitarianism strength and uh, weakness, not addressing the root causes, but only addressing the consequences of uh, disaster or any, any kind of uh, crisis. That is my first uh, introductory uh, point. The second one is about, um, and then I will go to the at core of the subject. The, the, the second one, uh, just as an appetizer, is a look at how the notion of humanitarianism and uh, the, the world, the word uh, humanitarian, humanitarianist, humanitarian crisis uh, are used, uh, are commonly uh, used. Let's look at what happened uh, recently in Haiti. I won't speak of Haiti uh, in detail. I won't comment uh, what has been done, though we, of course, I'll be quite happy to come back to this uh, during the discussion. But uh, well, it was described as a humanitarian crisis. This is a commonly used uh, formula, which, in fact, I don't like uh, at all because it brings together uh, a number of, it covers a number of very different uh, crisis, uh, massacres, civil wars, uh, natural disasters, uh, 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 etc. So it's uh, rather a blinding and enlightening uh, approach to a uh, real crisis. So let's talk of uh, a, an, an earthquake. The earthquake, the earthquake which occurred in, uh, in Haiti was an opportunity for a number of uh, states, different governments, to offer 
there, uh, they, and of course, we all have in mind what the United States uh, did, sending a huge uh, ship, hospital ship, and uh, 10,000 soldiers, and, and uh, putting the uh, airport up and running uh, to deliver the, 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 the relief. This uh, relief effort was, I must uh, say it uh, straight away, was extremely uh, useful and uh, was highly appreciated by the Haitian, regardless of uh, any uh, other uh, uh, consideration. But what I would like to <coughs> insist on is the fact that uh, it was called a humanitarian uh, aid, a humanitarian effort, humanitarian uh, something, not just an emergency aid or solidarity or whatever. It was called humanitarian. Okay, fine. No one seems to be uh, keen to uh, debate it, to put this uh, in, in question. Now, let's think of what happened uh, in Lebanon uh, during the summer of 2006 when the Israelis attacked uh, Lebanon and uh, ransacked and destroyed whatever was on their way. Uh, we all have in mind the images of uh, what was done uh, at the time. It was like a huge uh, tsunami, an earthquake, well, it was a military uh, attack, a deadly military uh, attack. After this attack, no massive relief effort was launched, though a number of uh, NGOs were uh, in the field trying their best to help the victims of this uh, attack. But one thing remained totally unchecked uh, and seen, and this thing is what the Hezbollah uh, did in this uh, area. I must have uh, spread the word, I'm not a fanatic of Hezbollah, I'm not a fanatic of uh, the United States uh, policy in general, but just to be, uh, uh, just to be fair, uh, it is to be, it is worth noting that uh, the Hezbollah sent a number of technical advisors and uh, people who were both uh, advise and finance the reconstruction of a number of uh, houses which had been destroyed by uh, the Israelis. And uh, they never uh, asked, uh, it seemed not to have been asking uh, what was the religious affiliation or the political preferences of the people they were uh, sending funds or giving advice uh, to. This is, strictly speaking, a humanitarian uh, aid. Of course, it is inspired by political consideration. Hezbollah is a political party and it has political uh, goals. No one uh, ignores this. But the US government, as any government, has its own political goals, its own political views. And the way uh, this, the notion of humanitarianism is distributed, the way it is applied in, in a very one-sided way, uh, uh, as a self-evident way of naming what the U.S. is doing in Haiti, and it didn't even cross the minds of the people who were talking about what was happening in Lebanon to use the word humanitarian to describe, in order to describe what the Hezbollah was doing in South Lebanon, that shows how history plays in our minds, uh, how uh, we have a kind of predetermined view of the world which inspires the way we describe it and the way we name uh, uh, things. Uh, another uh, aspect, uh, another way of uh, using the word uh, human, the notion of humanitarianism or to apply the, the adjective uh, humanitarian uh, is what, what happened uh, in uh, New Orleans uh, in 2005 uh, after the the, the hurricane uh, Katrina. Uh, first, let's note that no one, at least publicly, uh, at least when we speak of government, <laughs> no one there uh, offer uh, its resources uh, uh, to shoulder uh, the US administration, which obviously had failed in addressing uh, the consequences of the Katrina hurricane in the New Orleans, I suppose everyone has in mind what happened uh, at the time with people with any, uh, without any uh, support, without uh, any uh, uh, relief or any way to get out of the flooded uh, areas. 
In fact, it's not exactly true. Some countries decided that they would offer their uh, aid in the name of humanity, in the name of, in the name of uh, humanitarian uh, principles. These countries were uh, Venezuela and Cuba. And uh, well, Chavez and uh, Castro uh, publicly offered to uh, send uh, relief teams, uh, the, the Venezuela offered to send oil to those who needed it, uh, etc. Of course, uh, well, the White House turned a blind eye and well, turned the proposition down and did not accept uh, anything from uh, these uh, people. But it is interesting to uh, to observe, to consider that there was a real need for these people to relief, to, to, to get relief from any place uh, it was coming from, uh, including Cuba or uh, Venezuela. But that it was self-evident, uh, without no discussion, that the offers uh, set forth by, by uh, Castro and uh, Chavez were aimed at humiliating the, 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 the U.S. Uh, government, which in fact was absolutely true. They had no other idea in mind than communicating uh, uh, the, the, the White House, and for many people it was just good news. And it was not the Katrina hurricane, but the communication of the, the, the White House, including me, I must say. But the, the, my point is that there is a kind of discrepancy, a kind of, uh, there is a sharp contrast, or there should be a sharp contrast between the two things I've just uh, said. One is the obvious need of the people for uh, uh, relief, and the way we usually think that, well, there is a need, there is an offer, and uh, both should meet, and this is what humanitarian need is all about. But this was not uh, matched, and, and the, 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 the offer which uh, was uh, the offer which was coming from uh, the Venezuela and uh, El Caso was evidently considered as a humiliation. In other terms, in certain <laughs> circumstances, offering humanitarian aid without any, well, maybe in an aggressive way, but without uh, any uh, hidden uh, agenda, it was just evident, can be considered a public humiliation. And uh, this, I think, uh, should be always uh, kept in mind because what, what applies to uh, the White House, to Washington, applies as well to uh, other uh, countries. Uh, except if we uh, think that, uh, well, we, we sort of we, we buy the notion of uh, exceptionalism, of US exceptionalism, of US manifest destiny. But I don't think many people would buy this uh, argument in this room, and I don't think many people in the world buy this uh, argument. So what applies to the United States applies to the rest of the world. But obviously, in our mind, there is, again, a kind of split uh, between who is supposed to bring good things and who is supposed to receive good things. And the nice world of uh, well, humanitarian aid, of humanitarianism, applies only to some, uh, well, to the usual suspects, and uh, the rest uh, is uh, not supposed to use this, uh, this word for the, uh, themselves. Now, uh, having said that, I'd like to, uh, well, to go back into recent uh, history in order to clarify uh, what I think are the main uh, issues which are at play in the humanitarian circles and the, in the humanitarian uh, discourse. Let's note that uh, the 90s uh, came to a close with the notion of a uh, humanitarian war. Uh, they started with a humanitarian war in Somalia and they uh, ended with another humanitarian war in Kosovo. And I think this decade is extremely interesting to study and, uh, well, I won't have the time to do so, but we might, during the discussion, come back to some episodes, the ones you might be more interested in. But I think it's quite important to have this uh, in mind in order to get closer to the subject, which is the relationship between humanitarianism and, to some extent, imperialism or imperial wars, uh, and, uh, uh, etc. Uh, 
I mentioned Somalia, I'd just like to dwell a, few, a couple of minutes on this uh, subject because Somalia was the laboratory for uh, so-called humanitarian uh, intervention. As uh, Gilbert said in his uh, introduction, I wrote, it's not a book in fact, it's, uh, it's a small essay, uh, which by the way is available in English, this one, because it's an essay, a notebook I ever wrote, was translated, whatever, well, translated in, uh, in, uh, in English, but some uh, articles and, and essays. This one is available on the web, so if ever you're interested, you can get it. What, it was written more than 15 years ago, so uh, it might be outdated, but still, uh, there's a description, uh, uh, an accurate, uh, precise description of what uh, happened in the, in the country. For this conference, I will just mention that uh, Somalia was not a country at the time. I'm not meaning that, that it was not a country in, in real. What, I, what I'm saying is that it was considered a laboratory by uh, well, both the UN Secretary General and the then uh, Secretary General, which was Ghali, and it became a laboratory for the UN system uh, in general and the number of uh, Western uh, countries. And uh, as you probably all know, uh, well, the war is still raging uh, in, in uh, Somalia in the name of civilization, of the Western world, of democracies, of democracy. Uh, day after day, civilian population is being shelled, uh, is being arrested uh, uh, by uh, UN labeled and uh, Western uh, supported uh, forces in this uh, country. That all started, I mean, the war started by the late 80s and uh, uh, became uh, really an atoll war in the early 90s. And uh, Somalia was host to a, a massive uh, UN sponsored uh, intervention named uh, Rest of Hope. Uh, after 18 years now, it's rather uh, funny, though it's not a really laughable issue, but it's rather funny to remember that uh, it was about hope. Uh, and uh, what happened in this country is that uh, hundreds, maybe more than a thousand people, in fact, uh, there was no body count, there was no way to evaluate to, to assess the number of uh, casualties which were uh, caused by this uh, intervention. But uh, by the end of 92 uh, and through the year uh, 93, a hundred of civilians fell under the, the shooting, the, the bullets uh, shot by uh, this uh, Rest of Hope uh, coalition, namely the UN terms of and uh, it rapidly became a kind of uh, cowboy uh, movie with a wanted guy, I mean, uh, General Hadid, uh, who was uh, uh, searched, who was uh, chased by the, both the UN and, uh, and the US uh, troops. And in this hunt, in this manhunt, uh, more uh, civilians uh, were uh, still uh, killed. And I think that for the first time since the colonial uh, era, uh, many people died uh, in the name of uh, life, uh, life-saving uh, operation, in the, lay, in the name of uh, so-called uh, humanitarian uh, uh, principles. I'll finish with Somalia uh, by uh, reminding that uh, in March 93, and for those work on the UN system and the general uh, relief system, it's quite interesting to, to note that in March 93, one of the most ambitious uh, and probably the most ambitious uh, ever uh, resolution was uh, passed at the UN uh, Security uh, Council, the number of uh, the, 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 it was called, uh, I don't really uh, remember uh, now, but it was about uh, setting up a full-fledged uh, state, uh, including uh, police, uh, justice, health, education, uh, public uh, works, uh, well, everything. So it, the, 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 this uh, intervention was supposed to lead to the, uh, to the, the process of uh, state uh, building, which, by the way, is the, how we call the 
Western uh, intervention in Afghanistan. It's about uh, nation and state uh, building. Uh, and this uh, operation includes a number of uh, NGOs which uh, work uh, to this, which endeavor uh, to build a nation and to build a state, just as our uh, predecessors in Vietnam during the 50s and the 60s, many, many, by the way, in the 60s were working on this too. State building was how they would describe uh, what they were doing for the refugees, for uh, people's education, uh, in the name of democracy and in the name of building a fair and decent uh, state to resist uh, the, the assaults of barbarity, which was launched by the northern, uh, northerners, i.e. the, the uh, communists. The, the, the other side were the, the communists, were the Reds uh, at the time. It became the Islamist, it became the, the, the Green uh, in, in modern time. But the idea remains the, the, the same. There is the civilization, there is barbarity, and there is a clear line which divides uh, both. And humanitarian is about, uh, and uh, in a way, I'm not saying, uh, I say, involved in humanitarian aid uh, for decades now, and this is not my idea of uh, what uh, humanitarianism is or can be. But uh, common sense, common wisdom calls the humanitarianism what uh, we would call defense of Western uh, civilization. And uh, uh, this is uh, exactly the, uh, the ongoing uh, uh, problem. By the way, again, uh, another uh, remark on, on uh, Somalia, which is extremely important uh, also to have in mind uh, when you consider, for instance, uh, what happens now in Darfur, what, what's been happening in Darfur over the last uh, five to six years. Uh, six years, I think, the war started exactly six years ago, uh, seven years ago, sorry. <coughs> the, uh, there was, and Boutros Ghali is the one who did this, there was a huge manipulation of uh, figures uh, when uh, uh, Boutros Ghali decided that there should be an intervention because probably he wanted to be the first Secretary General who uh, would have reactivated the original means which were handed over to the UN system after the Second World War. So he wanted to set up a UN military force and, uh, and uh, uh, set up a real state, a UN sponsored state in uh, Somalia, kind of trust issue council, which was in fact, the status of the, of the UN in 1945. Uh, to achieve this, he manipulated the, the, the figures, uh, uh, stating that 80% uh, of the food, of food aid which was sent to Somalia was diverted, taken by so-called warlords, uh, by uh, militiamen, and uh, therefore uh, enhancing uh, famine and, and uh, plunging uh, hundreds of millions of people, hundreds of thousands or even millions of people uh, into starvation and then uh, was being responsible for uh, massive uh, death. That was absolutely false. But I can tell you, as I said, I was the, the, the president of the uh, Frontier in France. We had a rather clear idea of uh, the amount of aid which was so called diverted uh, by the militiamen. I mean, it's so called, I mean, it is rather a, a Quotation that uh, a word I would really uh, use. Not, I'm not saying that it was no diversion of aid. What I'm saying is that part of this diversion of aid was uh, done by people who really needed uh, this food, and uh, young militiamen were uh, belonging to families who were uh, in a very uh, bad situation, and they were sold. It was a kind of unorganized uh, redistribution of what was supposed to be distributed to, anyway, to, to the Somalis. So it was not it was an unorderly distribution of, of aid, but it was still, a, at least partly, a distribution of aid, and not as the Butros Valley and a number of people were, were, uh, were affirming, it was not about reselling this uh, food aid on the international market. It was worth nothing, except for those who were starving. So it, it had no financial value, it just had a value for those who needed it to, to uh, survive. 
And our estimation, along with the uh, International Red Cross, and just you need to know that the Red Cross, the International Red Cross, International Committee of the Red Cross, to be the ICRC, RCRC estimation, and MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières estimation uh, about diversion of aid were ranging from 10% to 30%. And again, the uh, important part of this uh, aid was used just to feed the people, which was the idea of sending aid to uh, Somalia. So from 10 to 30%, and even probably less, <coughs> to 90%, which in fact, as it was perceived and received, meant the totality of the of food aid, the emergency food aid which was sent to Somalia, was diverted, was stolen, and was feeding uh, the, the war. That was the common cliche, uh, which was uh, pervasive, which was absolutely uh, everywhere. So that was, that was, this is what set the war in motion. This is what uh, uh, triggered the, 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 the uh, uh, sending troops uh, in, in uh, Somalia and then getting uh, in a sort of humanitarian bloodshed, which I call the uh, uh, humanitarian crime in my uh, small uh, essence. But having I mean, now uh, end with, uh, with Somalia, in fact, uh, not far from ending my. Uh, uh, when should I end? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 7 30? Uh, 20 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. <coughs> That's really good. Um, uh, why am I recalling some aspects of Somalia? I'm aware that uh, it's only some aspects of complex situation and I need more uh, details. But, well, we don't have the time for this. But why am I recalling uh, this? It's because it was a, a laboratory, it was a kind of scientific, uh, social scientific experience. But the, what you usually do when you carry out an experience is that, well, when you interpret it, you reflect on it, you draw some lessons uh, from uh, what you've seen and what you've done and what you've tried. But it seems that no lesson was learned from uh, Somalia. And more uh, in the uh, NGOs, humanitarian NGOs world than anywhere, and the UN world than anywhere else. I, I think that. Uh, Part of the military in the world um, reflected on this, though I'm skeptical when I see what's happening in, in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, they uh, might be over optimistic uh, about the military, maybe, but at least I know the humanitarian world, both in the NGO and in the in its UN parts. And my impression is that, uh, well, we haven't learned a lot uh, from it. We haven't learned that. For instance, weapons are a very uh, ineffective and very dangerous uh, humanitarian uh, tool. And if I said so, it's because the subsequent decade was marked by a number of, by a couple of very important initiatives, which I think show show that uh, well, these lessons were not. Uh, and these two initiatives are. Uh, the responsibility to uh, protect, which uh, was born a bit later on in the uh, late uh, 90s, uh, early uh, 20s, uh, the 2000s, sorry. <coughs> and uh, the ICC, the International Criminal uh, Court. Let's remember that uh, throughout the, the, the 90s, uh, most NGOs, including uh, mine, uh, NSF, uh, though I was rather lukewarm, and at least not very enthusiastic. rather positive at the time uh, towards this uh, initiative. Most NGOs, as I was saying, quite showed a, a, a very big enthusiasm uh, on the idea of establishing uh, an international criminal court in the name of peace, in the name of building peace, building stability, security for the people. And under the slogan that uh, there could no be possible peace without justice, which uh, I think that many of you belong to this category, which uh, for those who are familiar with history uh, in general is a rather ludicrous. Uh, uh, if there was 
no peace without justice, the whole world would be at war, uh, because there's never been such a thing as justice to conclude a war. So uh, it, we must admit the fact that war can come to an end without any kind of trial and the criminals being uh, judged and, uh, and uh, condemned to, to custody. But what is really striking is that, uh, including in the field of human rights, uh, well, I have started uh, my, my trajectory, my, my career, so to speak, in, the, uh, in this uh, small uh, world with human rights organizations fighting for the liberation of people who were uh, unfairly, uh, unjustly detained uh, in, uh, in custody. And I must say that I still adhere to this, uh, this, uh, this way of doing things and to this uh, objective. But what, what I'm struck by is that nowadays, and that has started in the, in the 90s, most human rights organizations are mobilized on another objective, though this, this one, the, the one I've just mentioned, has not disappeared, uh, fortunately it is still present, but it is sort of outweighed uh, uh, by uh, an, another uh, objective which is to put people in jail and uh, having cops and judges as uh, eminent human rights figures is uh, a, a situation which has appeared uh, through the, the, the 90s and the, 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 the process through which this uh, occurred is the, uh, so the massive support brought to this notion of uh, international uh, criminal court and achieving peace through justice and uh, through well, the judgment of the massive uh, uh, criminals. So this is one uh, uh, aspect, this is one uh, um, track of mobilization which was taken by the most uh, NGOs. The other one, a bit uh, later on, but it appeared uh, in the late uh, 90s and, and was uh, became really successful in 2005 when in September 2005 it was adopted by both the Security Council and the General Assembly of the United Nations. I mean, I, of course, um, I'm, I'm talking of uh, the, this document uh, the responsibility to protect the R2P uh, document. In fact, uh, well, I'm not a law person, I, I'm, I'm not very familiar with the status of these uh, documents. It's not a resolution, it's not a vote, it's, uh, I, I know exactly what it is in uh, uh, law terms, but what, what I say is that in, what I'm, I'm seeing and what I want to insist upon is that in political terms, it was widely, unanimously, accepted as a, a common goal for the well, uh, humankind uh, in uh, general through its representative at the United uh, Nations. So what is R2P uh, all, all about? Um, two different as in one very classical, which doesn't need any time to understand, it's about putting together all the diplomatic and usual means to bring about peace when uh, in, in a situation of war. Okay, that's about diplomacy, negotiations, mediation, etc. Nothing really new. Uh, it's just uh, various uh, tools uh, which are just uh, put together in a small uh, document. And there are three to four lines which are uh, important in this uh, document, which is a five page document. Three or four lines which uh, more or less say that in case of crimes of war, crimes against humanity or uh, genocide, uh, military action should be uh, uh, taken and troops should be sent to uh, put an end to uh, these uh, mass violences or these mass uh, atrocities. So it is a uh, uh, re activation of the notion of just wars, uh, which is at play in the uh, R2P. And by the way, the main principles which are invoked, uh, uh, explicitly stated in uh, this uh, document, relate very clearly to uh, St. Thomas' uh, notions of uh, just uh, wars. So uh, it is clearly uh, sitting on the 
on uh, this uh, notion of uh, just war. And again, most NGOs either didn't really state uh, anything or for the most part of them uh, uh, declared their enthusiasm for the RTP. At last, mass atrocities would be forbidden. Uh, and coming from France, uh, some of you might be familiar with the French political life. We have a, a Minister of Foreign Affairs named Bernard Kouchner, who was one of the co-founders of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières. And uh, he's the author, with, uh, along with a uh, few other mates, he's the author of the notion of devoir d'ingérence, droit devoir d'ingérence, the right or the duty to interfere. There is no exact uh, satisfactory translation of uh, ingérence, uh, as far as we can uh, observe uh, in English. But we, I think we all see what we uh, mean uh, by, by this. It's the right to say, well, this is forbidden. And uh, to uh, go to a country and uh, uh, impose the kind of liberal peace. Uh, that has no real translation into French. That's purely <laughs> English uh, <laughs> notion, but uh, again, it's, uh, I think, very uh, useful. Uh, so, of course, uh, what is a liberal peace? Uh, the one which was uh, imposed uh, in uh, Iraq or in Afghanistan or in Palestine, what, I mean, where do we, what is this, the, the, the observation point which enables us to say, well, this is an unjust war and we should stop it, and this is a decent war, and well, okay, let's go for it, it's, uh, it's fine. That is, the, I think, the, the hardcore of uh, what is usually called uh, soft power. Uh, soft power is not only, uh, not only enforced through music and Hollywood movies and, and so on, though it's quite uh, important, by the way, for those who've seen Black Hawk Down, uh, they will understand what I mean by soft power coming from Hollywood, because I mean, the, the way Somalia and the rest of Hope Operation is described is really telling and really very interesting to, to analyze. But uh, the, the point I, I, I want to make is that uh, this uh, newly uh, dark notion of R2P, which uh, draws on the, the notion of uh, droit d'ingérence, but makes it more palatable to uh, uh, UN uh, circles and to the international uh, community. And as an evidence of this, uh, well, as I said, it was unanimously uh, accepted, probably rather passively uh, accepted, but still there was no objection to, uh, to it. So the, the idea that uh, just war exists and that uh, in the name of humanitarian principles, the protection of civilians, prevention of mass atrocities, wars which should be launched in order to stop uh, wars, this is the new uh, humanitarian paradox, which is quite vivid and widely uh, supported, in, probably more in England and in the UK and the United States than anywhere uh, else. You've got the main NGO uh, coalition, I mean, English-speaking coalition, uh, including CARE, Oxfam, uh, Human Rights Watch, International Crisis Group, and a number of prominent uh, relief and human rights NGOs involved in this uh, uh, R2P uh, coalition, which means in, in this war for good coalition. And uh, this is exactly what I would call imperialism. That is modern imperialism, which doesn't deal with concurring uh, new lands, with dominating uh, new uh, resources. It's just about establishing the order we think is fair. The order, uh, the world order, which has been decided by a certain part of the order without consulting the other part of the uh, uh, order. And what is really, uh, look at Darfur, and I will finish on, uh, uh, on this in order to leave time for the discussion, but look at uh, Darfur. Uh, no doubt uh, that mass atrocities happen there, as they happen in any war. Uh, Darfur is, is, a, is a civil war, uh, no less, no more terrible 
than any other uh, uh, civil war. But again, as it was done in uh, Somalia, the big and, and uh, on, still ongoing manipulation of uh, figures uh, was there, and uh, the figures of uh, 300 to 500,000 people killed by the, by the government uh, troops is uh, probably uh, 10 times what really uh, happened uh, in the ground. So uh, my, my own figure uh, is about 50 to 50. 60,000 people, 50 to 60,000 casualties, which is enormous, which is, uh, we're talking of human lives, uh, who, uh, human losses uh, in, uh, in, in Bafu. But still, it's not 500,000 or a million as it was uh, uh, said. But uh, these figures were used to justify a, a massive opinion campaign in order to send troops to uh, Darfur, and uh, I'm not really aware of what happened here in the UK, I'm more aware of what happened in the United States, where it all started. So you may, may be interested to come back on, on this, but uh, let's leave it for the discussion. But it all started in the, in the States, and it continued uh, uh, massively in France uh, as well. And during the, uh, the, the electoral, uh, the presidential campaign in 2007 in my country, most candidates uh, gathered in one night to in, in a very famous uh, meeting place in, in Paris in order to denounce the ongoing genocide and to uh, promise that uh, if they, one of, them, one of them had to be elected, and the one who would be elected would not allow this genocide to continue and would do whatever he could, he or she could, uh, to stop it, uh, which was, by the way, uh, which was a, a way to uh, enact this notion of responsibility to protect or the right to uh, interfere, uh, but uh, stated and, and retaken really by uh, one of the most politi French political uh, uh, most prominent uh, French political uh, uh, figures. Just to give you an idea of how serious or it may uh, be, of course, it was forgotten the next day after the election or the, let's say the next week, the week uh, subsequent week. But still, uh, they say it and in, in politics, uh, words have meaning, they will have their importance. and. <clears throat> The idea that that country was perpetrating, that Bashir, the president of Sudan, was perpetrating a uh, genocide, was pervasive, was accepted by everything. And people like uh, Messa Sans Frontières, or like me, in a more personal way, who were uh, uh, criticizing the, the use of the notion of genocide, who were talking of the civil war, who were, uh, were accused of downsizing the plight of the, the foreign accusing of playing, or accused of playing into the hands of the uh, Khartoum uh, regime, of being complicit of, of uh, those uh, uh, criminals. It was a very heated uh, issue. Okay. It was, uh, what was a play, I think, was the idea that there was a new uh, imperial notion of uh, humanitarianism, which uh, was opposed, or which could be denounced or criticized by people like uh, MSF and some others, but MSF uh, was not very, really, was rather low in his uh, position at, at the time, at, at least, who opposed the notion of uh, imperial uh, humanitarian uh, war as, a, as an imperial uh, war. So now, uh, this notion of responsibility to, to, to protect is still debated, is still uh, uh, an issue which is discussed uh, in, the, in the United Nations. I'm not really afraid that uh, we will see in the, in the next, uh, in, the, in, the, in the close future, uh, massive military uh, interventions uh, all over the place because well, the resources are, are not there and uh, maybe for bad reasons, but for uh, objectives and uh, objective and very strong reasons, these uh, wars won't take place. But the notion is there. Uh, the, the, uh, and, and for 
humanitarian volunteers, for uh, human rights volunteers, having the idea that they work in the field but as a kind of an excuse, and this is what happened in Darfur, as a kind of alibi, uh, 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 provisional, uh, uh, temporary uh, uh, presence, which should be sooner or later replaced, or which ought to be uh, replaced, by a military who will do the real job, which is to kill, those, to kill the killers, to occupy the land, to establish uh, security. And uh, as, uh, well, as anyone can say, well, you've loved Lebanon, you've loved Iraq, you, you like Lebanon, you've loved uh, Iraq, you will love Darfur and other places like this where uh, humanitarian uh, intervention will uh, take place. But just imagine how, in what state, of, in what mind state you are, when you think that you're just an excuse or just a kind of vanguard uh, which should be followed by uh, troops, and if troops don't come in, it, it, it would mean that uh, the so-called international community doesn't do the job, and that you're just an, an uh, excuse. This is a way to, well, to, um, to forget uh, what you're doing to diminish, to to reduce to nothing uh, the, the what the humanitarian uh, community is doing uh, in the ground. And by the way, talking of Darfur is a good opportunity to just underline, to put a, an emphasis of an aspect which is very rarely uh, taken up, which is the new efficiency or the, 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 of the humanitarian, the new professionalism of the humanitarian community at large, including both UN agencies and uh, NGOs. Uh, without this massive uh, peaceful intervention, tens and tens of thousands of Darfurians would have died. And uh, thanks to this uh, intervention, I'm not sure intervention is the right word because it has some military connotation, maybe in, in English. So if it has, just forget that and just take it in the French meaning. Uh, you mentioned doesn't, doesn't uh, entail any kind of uh, military uh, connotation. Thanks to this massive uh, intervention, uh, well, many Darfurians will, will live, and uh, the future of Darfur and the future of Sudan as an as a, uh, inclusive nation can be envisaged. Uh, and this is quite important, and I think it's the main political outcome. Uh, of this uh, intervention, though there are some shortcomings, there are some, uh, some uh, uh, drawbacks in this uh, intervention, but, but still I think that uh, the positive aspects, including the political ones, are really uh, what uh, characterize uh, this uh, intervention. And, well, thanks God, uh, so to speak, there was no there was only a threat of military intervention, but never a, a, a real uh, intervention. So now, to cut this my, my lecture uh, shorter than I would like, uh, I will just jump, not to my conclusion, because I don't have anything to conclude, but just kind of closing remarks. Uh, I think that what is uh, at play now in the small uh, but sorry uh, humanitarian uh, world is to liberate ourselves, to free, uh, to, to, I would say to, to release ourselves from a sentiment of almightiness. Uh, this uh, this uh, notion that is closely related to uh, the 19th century uh, colonialism uh, approach, colonialist uh, uh, approach, and uh, which, in practical terms, for, for, for us, the well, contemporary uh, humanity, translate into the fact that we uh, seem to think that we are the, the voice of the voices, that we speak in their uh, behalf, that not only do we uh, try to release their plight, but uh, we also try to uh, speak on their uh, uh, behalf. And that is, I think, what should be absolutely uh, avoided. And uh, speaking of this, of course, I mean all
also that Jibir uh, mentioned that I've worked on the Anna Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, but uh, quite interesting in uh, Arendt's uh, approach and uh, the, the notion she uh, worked on, the, the, the politics of, uh, of pity uh, and the, 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 the way she articulates pity and, and, and terror and how you justify terror in the name of the victims, in the name of the pity you feel uh, uh, towards these uh, people, these voiceless uh, people who deserve to be uh, defended, but defended in a way that you are ready to kill uh, to relieve their plight and you uh, are uh, especially ready to speak uh, in their uh, name. So, uh, eliminating uh, violence from uh, the catalog, from the, the humanitarian toolbox, uh, so uh, to speak, is an urgent uh, issue. And to my regret, I must see, I must observe that uh, most NGOs do not seem to be very enthusiastic at taking firm stances against the use of violence on behalf of uh, humanitarianism. Uh, on the contrary, uh, a good uh, part of them, as I said, uh, support this RTP, RTP notion and they are part of this RTP coalition, which is exactly the uh, uh, contract. And in fact, um, I'm sorry, I should be more emphatic, maybe more novel, but uh, this would be my uh, last words, and this is the time for me to thank you for your attention. Thank you.